Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another compilation, and we're going to be talking about HF in a hurricane. But before we get started, I want to take a few seconds to thank our sponsor, The Column. The Column is a free email newsletter about how companies make chemicals at a global scale. If that sounds interesting to you, be sure to check out the link in the description at the end of the video. I want to thank The Column for their support of this channel. It's not a very severe accident, but I almost stabbed myself with a needle with bromopyridine. So I was doing a reaction in a one neck round bottom flask under inert gas, and I was trying to add the bromopyridine to the reaction mixture. This is actually a really common way that chemists add chemicals to a solution just using a syringe and a needle. You might not know that this is super common, but it's extremely common. I first filled up my syringe with bromopyridine and held it in my left hand and then tried to remove the gas inlet adapter with my right hand and I felt a slight pricking. Yeah, it's one of the most terrifying things when this happens. Luckily, the needle did not stab through the skin, and I only got slight irritation, but it was really scary, as the MSDS said that it is fatal in contact with skin, and I was feeling unwell after that. I guess due to panic and anxiety, and it was possible for the needle to go in deeper if I was moving my hands faster. Since then, I am avoiding doing manipulations when there is a syringe in my hand. I have heard about people stabbing themselves with a needle, but I always thought that it was because they were careless, and I would never do that. However, that was wrong. When you are trying to do something fast, you do lose focus towards something potentially dangerous. You should never rush doing things, seriously. Yeah, I have uh, accidentally pricked myself with needles a few times in the lab, but only one time it contained a chemical. And I think I already talked about this in a previous video. It was like an analog of a quinoline or a quinine compound, but uh, I was still fine afterwards. I also had a more recent incident where I was trying to transfer stuff into an NMR tube, and I was literally just putting the cap on an NMR tube. And it shattered, and the, it like cut me, and I got a mixture of chloroform and an analog of an amino acid like into me. So I like washed it out really well, and I bled a lot all over the place as I was running to the sink to wash out the wound. And fortunately, I was fine, and there was no uh, side effects. But I do have a scar on the finger that got stabbed with the NMR tube. Uh, so you know, you, you should always be careful. Just because something's not sharp yet doesn't mean it's not about to be sharp. And when you're working with needles, always, always, always track the tip of the needle, and that needs to be like half of what you're focusing on the whole time. A bachelor student had to quench some potassium hydride residues after a reaction. For this, he took a vessel with a screw top lid, and he filled it with potassium hydride and placed everything in an ice bath. Then he took water and added it. He then sealed the vessel and walked away. Not a second later, the whole fume hood exploded, and a PhD student was nearly hit by debris. <laughs> The fume hood was destroyed and had to be completely replaced. The student let out a quiet sorry. <laughs> there were no consequences for him. The PhD student took a vacation for two weeks to get over it. Fun fact, he got a 1.0 for his bachelor's thesis and will do his master's thesis there. Yeah, a 1.0 on the GPA scale is not good. Hi, in the lab where I was doing my PhD, there was two undergrads that were doing nitrations of isoxazoles. They were making it outside of the fume hood with a tiny bowl of ice and without a trap. Oh my gosh, I wasn't nearby the lab, so when I got to the lab, I got there seconds before the situation. They weren't around when I came to the lab, a major concern. Then a colleague shouted to me, and when I turned around, I saw a brownish-red cloud forming on the lab ceiling. The flask was releasing the nitrous oxide, so I take a wet cloth, put it over the mouth of the flask, and take it to the fume hood and run out of the lab. Now I know the unpleasant aroma of the nitrous oxide. Yeah, it has a really terrible smell. They repeat their reactions in the fume hood after good punishment, but then again they went out of the lab, and again their reactions blew up. One flask produced the nitrous oxide, and the other foamed up and got projected to the fume hood ceiling, ruining the counterweight of the safety glass. After that they earned the nickname of the Nitro Guys. One was taller and one was shorter. Individually, their nicknames were Nitrate and Nitrite. That is hilarious. You know, if you're ever doing reactions that could potentially produce gases, or if you're ever doing something like a distillation, you should always be attending to your apparatus. And if you have to go to the bathroom or go do something for some reason, you should make sure that someone else is actually going to watch it. Not just say they're going to watch it, but that they're actually going to watch it. Because if you don't have like a more senior lab member watching things when no one's there, stuff can go wrong. I'm slowly becoming convinced that the majority of geologically educated folks either do it because they really like to lick rocks or else developed a taste for rocks as a result of exposure to the discipline. You know, I haven't seen very many people disagree. I've seen a couple comments saying, yeah, you know, you're not really supposed to do this. You could do other things. But I've seen a lot of comments agreeing with the fact that uh, geologists lick rocks. You can let me know down in the comments if you have anything new to add. Not one of my stories, but from an undergrad lab instructor. One of the experiments in the second year organic lab at my university is a Grignard reaction that makes the Grignard reagent from bromobenzene and then reacts the product with dry ice to make benzoic acid. 
Apparently the term dry ice was confusing for one of the students, as my lab instructor found them physically drying the ice cubes with a paper towel and adding it to their flask. Interesting idea. Yeah, that is hilarious. They are not going to be getting benzoic acid. They're going to actually be getting benzene. I was in a lab, Tiang Organic Lab, with a friend once. A student came up to us for help. They couldn't get their product to crystallize from solution. My buddy told them to scratch the flask. Right there in front of us, they hold the flask up and start scratching the outside of the flask with their fingernails. Immediately, beautiful crystals started coming out of solution. The student couldn't figure out why we were laughing so hard. So if you've never done any lab work growing crystals before, typically what you do is you take a glass stir rod and you scratch the inside of your reaction vessel and the scratching vibrations or the creation of new sites that could cause nucleation, the, the initiation of crystal growth, uh, can like occur as a consequence. But this person didn't understand that. So they were just like scratching the outside of the flask with their nails and somehow it worked. So maybe we've been doing it wrong this whole time. Who knows? If you've ever tried something like this and had crystals grow before, let me know down below. I have a good one. A few months ago, I was setting up a palladium catalyzed borelation reaction and I had a glass adapter with a 90 degree bend in it to pull a vacuum in the system. On my last freeze pump thaw cycle, I'm just going to pause here for a second. Freeze pump thaw is a process used to degas solvents or chemicals. And so what happens is you will freeze the chemical in liquid nitrogen. You will totally pump it all the way down. Then you'll remove the chemical from the liquid nitrogen under a uh, static vacuum and it will allow any gas to bubble out of solution. And usually this is like a process that you'll do three times. It's, it's one really effective way to degas solvents. Although degassing with a gas like helium is more effective. I gave the gas adapter a wiggle to make sure that the whole system was under vacuum. I must have pulled on it a bit too hard and it broke and cut me. I have definitely had this happen with uh, 90 degree band adapters. It's definitely a thing that happens. So I got a bandaid on it and went back to it. I saw that the reaction mixture was slightly red. Somehow I got blood on the adapter and that made its way into the flask. My reagents were already in there, so I just degassed it again and ran the reaction as usual. The funny thing is I got the best yield I ever got for that reaction. My blood might have catalyzed it in some way. I mean, it's definitely possible. You can um, couple, for instance, aryl halides using iron catalysis um, with Grignard, so it's definitely like a thing that happens. I would assume that there's some possibility that you could reduce the iron in heme to uh, mediate this sort of reaction, or maybe it's going through a potential radical-like process using heme as uh, the scaffold. Who knows? If you have any ideas, you're welcome to comment down below. Man, I'm not even into chemistry, and somehow these videos still have stories I can relate to. Anyway, there was an urban legend at my old high school that one of the old welding shop classes made the stupendously bad decision to put acetylene from a dented tank, yikes, that they couldn't do anymore due to safety policies, and how ironic, into an old weather balloon around the science department that they had lying around. Apparently they thought that they could still use it to do stuff. I don't know either. Well, they filled it up with the acetylene, and the balloon got big. Thankfully they did it outside, because as you can probably guess, even just filled with the acetylene, not even any oxygen, it exploded. No one seems to know how it exploded, but apparently it did. Supposedly it blew out several windows, oh my gosh, made anyone within about 200 feet go deaf for a few days, and the police came because it was heard from really far and sounded like a bomb. I mean, it literally is a bomb, right? Supposedly people up to a mile away heard it, but I have my doubts. Honestly, when I had my acetylene incident, it was so loud, it shook the whole building, literally. Like, down the hall... Uh, from the classroom that it happened in there was debris from the the roof ceiling tiles like just completely snowed and covered everybody's desk like we're talking halfway down the building and it was absolutely hilarious the closer to the blast radius it was the dirtier people's offices were so you know you might be surprised that it could be heard a mile away but i guarantee you if if the explosion is fast enough you could definitely hear it pretty far the greatest mishap in my lab experience was at my old company. My boss was doing a hydrogenation on a 10 to 12 gram scale of some Tetra CBZ protected steroid. CBZ is just um, carbonyl benzoxy. This is common for like nitrogen usually as a protecting group, but you can use it to protect uh, a couple different things. The reaction would only partially go even after filtering old and adding new catalyst, leaving a mixture of deprotected compound. So he decided that the hydrogenator, which was hilariously named Steely Dan, needed to be more pressurized. And heck, he decided it needed to be heated as well, because that would be good. I, I mean, we talked about this in the chlorine video. I'll include a card to the chlorine video here. You know, if heat happens, heat makes chemistry go faster, and sometimes you want chemistry to go faster, but sometimes chemistry can go too fast. Well, little did anybody know, Steely's shaker arm failed at some point, leaving the mixture with 200 mils of methanol and palladium on carbon to sit undisturbed and heating. 
After time, the whole thing detonated. He had placed this hydrogenator across the lab where no one was, so no one got hurt, but the explosion rocked the 3,000-foot building, and I'm sure that the one next to it got shook as well. It literally blew a hole in one of those heavy blast shields. That is insane. And put black carbon and palladium all over the pleb hood. That was only used for wacky ideas, and it was also the location of our chem pit. Yeah, you definitely have to be careful when you're handling palladium on carbon. It can definitely go wrong, and it can definitely start fires really easily, because instead of having a spark, that is your spark. That is your catalyst. It's super dangerous if you're not careful. One of the worst things that happened to me in my general chemistry class was when we were doing a titration lab. I was with a lab partner, and we were cleaning our fume hood. Meanwhile, behind us, another student had somehow managed to clog their burette. So in the student's infinite wisdom, they decided to violently shake the filled burette, spraying the whole front of my body and the back of my partner with not-so-dilute base. Yikes. Luckily, I was quick enough to put my notebook in front of my face as a shield. This was the final straw that got the student kicked out of the lab. They poured heavy metal salts down the drain, turned their distillation apparatus into a pipe bomb, etc. Moral of the story, eventually you will encounter an individual who has no regard for lab safety. Therefore, it is your job, along with everybody else in the lab, to help said person to be the safest they can possibly be, for your sake and for theirs. I couldn't agree with this more. You definitely have to be the person to wear the pants in the lab, and if there's several people wearing the pants in the lab, that's great. If you need very specific conditions, like 4 Kelvin and laser beams to make argon fluorohydride, Figueroa can do it at room temp by hand stirring for 24 hours. No special requirements needed. Yeah, that's right, Figueroa can do literally anything. Okay, I'm remembering a few stories. In elementary school, I took a mercury switch I took out of an old thermostat. I broke it and was playing with the mercury in my hand. When I was in middle school, I got my chemistry teacher to burn himself. He was doing the demo of setting a dollar bill on fire. And so if you've never seen this demo before, essentially what you do is you create a mixture of ethanol or isopropanol in water, and it's just rich enough to start catching fire, but it isn't uh, fuel rich enough to actually like burn the money. And so this is like essentially the demo that they're doing here and showing how it didn't burn. I would go to sushi all the time and they light the onion volcano with their hands using flaming Everclear, which is just very concentrated ethanol. I told my teacher he could cover his hand and it wouldn't burn him because it burned at a low temp. So he tried it. He apparently used isopropanol and not ethanol and burned himself. I felt bad, but it was funny. So I'm not sure that it's just the alcohol that matters here. I think it's making sure that you don't have anything above the flame because heat rises. So if he wasn't careful, it could just be that, you know, he was kind of being stupid with it. I would not encourage anybody to try this with Everclear or isopropyl alcohol. You should definitely only do this if you're a trained professional, and you could safely do so. I remember when I was younger that I had coincidentally had potassium permanganate and sulfuric acid, so I decided to mix them, and it made manganese heptoxide. I didn't know what this was, so I searched it up and found out what it was and what it could do. I decided it was a great idea to detonate this and make two other batches of it that I could also detonate. And in the process, it splashed concentrated sulfuric acid onto my eyelids. The reason I didn't go blind is because I blinked right as it splashed, because I wasn't wearing any goggles while making it. Luckily, nothing much happened, but one of the explosions did spew manganese dioxide dust into my face. Yikes, do not mix random chemicals. Yeah, absolutely, and always wear PPE. If you're not sure what a chemical will do, look it up first. You know, you might think you're going to run out of time, but if something goes wrong, you're going to run out of all of your time a lot faster. And you might struggle to see if you get stuff in your eyes, so definitely take safety seriously. Can confirm, geologists are rock lickers, and proud of it. To the point where I know a guy who got told HR would be called if he licked an aminoid in front of the secretary a second time. If you're not sure what an aminoid is, you could look it up. I have worked as a home chemist and an experimental chemist in a professional academic lab. Despite the many times I have nearly asphyxiated on chlorine, accidentally made TATP, and performed LAH reductions in possibly wet solvents, the worst experience I have ever had as a home chemist was with methyl ethyl ketone peroxide. I have previously synthesized the product about two weeks prior as a mild academic exercise, which I would not encourage any of you to reproduce, by the way. A feat of my chemical skill at the age of 16. During that period of my life, my ability to thoroughly clean glassware was mediocre at best, and this left a lot of impurities, which I now do not have being appropriately trained in an analytical lab. I remember I had invited my friend over. We'll call him Chris. Chris loved watching me perform chemistry and thought it was neat having been on the spectrum and not having the ability to perform labs in school. I stated I wanted to show him the reaction of sulfuric acid with some material, I believe some metal, and I had had the hindsight to give him safety specs, but as I only had one pair, I assumed my glasses alone would keep me safe. As I pipetted the sulfuric acid, there was a massive bang which made my ears ring. There was methyl ethyl ketone peroxide still in the pipette. Sulfuric acid sprayed all over me, most notably my face and glasses. It was dripping down the walls, leaving black trails of carbon. 
I rushed to the sink and washed with water as my friend watched, me comforting him during the experience so that he would stay calm. Eventually, I got washed, changed clothes, and cleaned the lab with bicarbonate. This is just to quench any acid that remains. This memory is still burned into my mind whenever I work with any chemical, and I believe it made me a better chemist. Still, to all the home chemists, be humble, be safe, and understand that you are only given one life, two eyes, two lungs, and one brain. Chemistry is a beautiful science, but it is unforgivable if you do not respect it. Give care to molecules, and they will do the same. Stay nerdy. Yeah, you know, I, I'm always hesitant to encourage people to try any sort of chemistry at home because there's no one to make sure that you're doing it safe, and oftentimes it's easier to cut corners with PPE and with safety procedures. So only do home chemistry if you can safely do so, and you know you can legally do so where you live. As I'm sure you likely know, petrochemical manufacturers use HF. Yes, anhydrous HF is used for the alkylation of arenes. When a hurricane hit, their facility was flooded, and the hazmat company I worked for was called in to clean up the unknowns. Oh my gosh, I was not prepared, nor can anyone ever be prepared, to clean up HF. Now, almost 22 years later, I am still dealing with, and will forever deal with, the effects that it has done to me. The special services division of the hazmat company is long gone, but HF is forever. I cannot believe that they had an HF hurricane. That is terrifying. I think I should talk about some of my experiences in an Indian high school chem lab. First off, safety is non-existent. If you check out some of the pictures in the school website and magazine, you might see some students wearing a proper lab coat and safety goggles, but who has time and money to do that for every class every day? We never wore PPE of any kind. There was also no eye wash or body wash station of any kind. If I recall correctly, there was one lonely ancient fire extinguisher in a corner that looked like it hadn't been checked in years. The tripod stands were rusty, and I always checked them before putting anything on them. Same with the wire gauze. Bunsen burners were originally copper, but caked in crud of some kind, and lighting them was as easy as trying to set a wet blanket on fire. And when they did burn, they coughed a lot. We did a lot of titrations. Sometimes they required acids, and they were always handled in droppers whose rubber bulb was half melted. Concentrated sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, and nitric acid were just left on a tray filled with sand in the open. We had to drop some into our test tubes ourselves, trying not to get any on our fingers, no gloves, or clothes, no coat. One day, the chemistry teacher walked in with a corner of her dress melted. Turns out some concentrated sulfuric acid had dripped on it. There were also a lot of fumes produced, and while analyzing salts, we were encouraged to take a whiff to try and identify what gas it produced. Of course, nitrate salts produce nitrogen oxides, and I guess I was the only person who knew how dangerous that was. Sometimes the erratic Bunsen burner would melt the hairs on my fingers. I'm a hairy person, but I couldn't pull back because I was holding glassware. This happened during my final practical exam, and there was nothing I could do. I couldn't afford to make a fuss of it in front of the central government appointed examiners. Oh, and of course, making mistakes was a no-no. So even if something went wrong, it was hardly ever reported. Can't be good practice at all. If you ever work in a lab with these kinds of safety incidents, make sure you go to your university administration or your HR. So thanks for watching. You might be interested in checking out another video from the channel. And with that, I hope you have a nice day. Not necessarily cursed, but funny looking. All of the molecules from Old MacDonald named a compound branched E9E9 oles. And you might be wondering why E9E9 ol. And it's because Old MacDonald had a farm E9E9 ol. <laughs>